correct? Amen. And this is going to come out exactly as planned and would exceed our expectations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Since we are live now, your prayer may help us. I don't, I, I don't think so. Okay, yes, we are. Awesome. So I'm meeting people. This is four o'clock. Gideon, I'm, make, I'm making you a host. I think that's what I should just do. So you have to be Okay. Chene, may you really help me with the program? But um, I can be first now. Welcome, everybody. Um, All right, we are just one minute away from starting, and um, I welcome everyone once again. We're going to be kickstarting exactly by four, but we'll just leave you know two minutes for people to join up, and then we'll begin the series. Um, thank you once again for joining us. This is Project Next, and we are bringing to you the Knowledge Series. Time check, 4 p.m. So good evening, everyone, once again. You're welcome to Project Next Knowledge Development Series. As promised, we will be beginning at 4, and uh, we might just give two minutes for people to join us. Um, once again, you're welcome. And um, the idea is sponsored by the University of Uyo Faculty of Law Alumni in conjunction with Project Next. Project Next is focused on, you know, building the next generation of um, legal professionals who would exceed in their different careers um, aside the traditional mode of practice. This, if you are here, I'd like you to just mute yourself. If you are not muted, please mute yourself. So the ground rules are that um, you will mute yourself and that um, if you have any questions, you could drop it in the chat box. If at any point people complain of not being able to join us, um, I would request that you refer them to our YouTube channel, You Know Your Law TV. By the way, I hope everybody on this session have all subscribed You Know, the you know Your Law TV because we'll be streaming live on You Know Your Law TV and we expect everybody to be there. Once again, you're welcome to this very awesome event and um, I'm happy to be doing Okay, once again, you're welcome to this event and I'm happy to be doing this with you. Um, so we will be starting right about now. We'll be starting right about now and I'll invite the Lausanne president, Mr. Savior Jacob to unmute himself and just say a word of prayer as we begin. All right, uh, good evening everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Gideon Eden. Let's pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of friends. We thank you for sustenance. We thank you for good leaders in the faculty. We thank you for good leaders in Lausanne. We thank you for good leaders in our alumni. We bless your name for a day like this and for this opportunity for us to learn and to discover more about ourselves and to build ourselves for the, for the Nigeria we want and also for a better nation. We pray for good understanding in this meeting and session today and that we may take home everything that is good 
to build the profession, the legal profession of our dreams. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, um, Savior, for that wonderful one. If you're not aware, Savior Jacob is the current president of the Law Student Association of Nigeria. Um, admittedly, his tenure has been, you know, affected by the acid strike, but we know that um, this is one of the interventions that um, he can also boast of because um, he has been really impactful and helpful to us towards achieving this event. Um, like we said, this intervention is for, you know, to fill in the knowledge gap that has been occasioned by the ASU strike. And we hope that everybody joining here would, you know, have um, everything to learn from this session. I hope you've gotten your starter pack and you're ready to, you know, go with us. Um, at the moment, we should be having the Dean of Law speak to us briefly. At the moment, we should be having the Dean of Law speak to us briefly but I suspect that she's not on this um, event as we speak. So um, I'll just you know, check through and be certain that she is on the call. But once again, today we are having a um, different session. We are having a session on international law. We are having a session where we have to speak to building our you know, profiles by Grace Kalu. We are also featuring majors and acquisition. And that will be coming from our own brother, Mr. David Etido. These are very wonderful members of, you know, the Alumni Association who have offered to give back to the Faculty of Law. And this is just um, one of the many events. Please, if you can hear me, I'll just like you to type on the chat box that you can hear me. I want to be sure that I'm not here alone. Okay, so um, this is um, one of the many interventions that the Project Next team is hoping to bring to students of the Faculty of Law. We are hoping to have uh, many more physical events after now, and we are hoping that this would be just the beginning of what is to come. Okay, so um, just checking, is Professor Moji with us, the Dean of Law? Okay, maybe Omarin can hear me, thank you. Kristen May can hear me. All right, uh -huh. it feels better now. It feels better now. Um, I'm trying to admit people. I can see Colin Sukamadiri. Okay, people are trying to join us. Uh, Matt is a super, I can see you. I can see Colin Sukamadiri, uh, Sharon Okore, all the wonderful members of the alumni we've had. So uh, a quick one too, if um, during any of the presentations by our speakers today, you have any question, I'll just like you to drop it in the chat box and it will be attended to. And if at any time, okay, yes, please. Um, we would request that um, only the speakers are on video so that um, we won't have, you know, um, any issues by the way. If you're not a speaker, um, you could just like that you turn off your video for now and then later you could just bring it up. Thank you very much for that. Okay, are we together? Infinix Smart 5, could you just turn off your video? Amos, could you just turn off your video for now? Okay, thank you. And one more thing, please, is Chineme here? Chineme, if you're here, just unmute yourself and say hi to everyone because I'll be doing this with Chineme and um, you'll be hearing her voice as we go on. Okay, um, we are still hoping that the Dean of Law would you know, give her remark in the next minute. And after the Dean of Law speaks, we would you know, begin the session fully. Um, sorry for the many you know, breaks in my conversation. I'm trying to also you know, get people into the conversation. Um, So our first speaker is already here, in, um, Mr. Seche Philip, and we're very excited to have him. Seche, you can say hi to everyone, please. 
Hi, Gideon. Hello, everyone. All right, hello, Sete. Please, once again, ground rules. If you're not a speaker, please um, kindly turn off your video for now um, so that we can focus on the right people, um, on the people who are speaking to us, please. If you're not a speaker, please just turn off the video. Mr. Lawrence, it seems you are raising your hand. Um, do you have an observation? Or uh, could that, that have been done in error? Okay, please, I'd just like you to lower your hand. Okay, so um, the dean is not in here yet. Um, that's the only person we were waiting for to begin. We started with, um, you know, we prayed, and then we were waiting for the dean. Immediately after the dean speaks, we will just go ahead to the first session. But at this point, I'll just love to introduce you to the person I'll be doing this with, the very amiable Chineme. Chineme, could you just say hi to everybody? Chinem, I think you're trying to speak, but we cannot hear you. All right, apologies for that. Uh, I think we have the Dean now. Please, could you confirm, is the Dean of Law with us? I know she has been trying to join us. Please, can anyone confirm is the Dean of Law with us? Welcome once again, welcome everyone. We are starting very shortly with the first speaker in five minutes, but the Dean has to speak to us. Can anybody confirm if she is here? Is anybody hearing me? Yeah, I yeah, can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Please just um, get back to meeting yourself, and then um, we'll just start. If the dean is not with us, she could give him her remark whenever she comes. So um, I think we'll just begin the session so that we don't um, wait for so long. Welcome, Edem. Thank you so much for joining us. And by the way, you made the faculty proud with your team at um, the International Humanitarian Law Competition. We appreciate the work you're doing. We appreciate the work you're doing. Um, the dean is not here yet, so I think we'll just kick start. I think we'll just kick start this event and then she would give her remark when she joins us. Uh, Mr. Seche, are you okay with you know taking your session now? Uh, I'm very okay. Um, why don't you just briefly, maybe buy some time while the dean tries to um, log in, maybe tell people what this is about oh. and um, just a, a brief, Rundown okay. of people who okay. will be participating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the dean just joined us and the dean just joined us. We started all of that. I think I told people what this um, is about and then we've just oh, been running sorry. from Yeah, so the dean is here with us and we will be excited to welcome the dean of law, Professor Mojisola Essain. 
and would be happy if she just gives um, her opening remark after we said she would take the session. And welcome, ma. You have the floor, ma. Thank you. Oh, you could admit yourself, please, and speak. I didn't know. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? I hope I can be heard. I'm heard. Yes, sir. yes, you're here. All right. Thank you. I was saying that I'm indescribably elated to welcome us all to this auspicious occasion of knowledge development series 1.0 that's been made possible by the alumni of the prestigious faculty of law, University of Rio, in collaboration with um, Project Next. Today's epochal event witnesses an assemblage of some young, brilliant members of the alumni of the Faculty of Law, University of Rio, who are already taking the award by storm. These were the ambassadors of the Faculty of Law, University of Rio, inspired the altruistic inclination towards giving back to the faculty that instilled in them their knowledge of adjectival and substantive law. And at this juncture, interrogating the discourse on emerging frontiers of legal practice, internships, scholarship opportunities, as well as general career positioning from the prism of their respective spheres of legal practice. The changes in dynamics in our present world order contemplate an adjustment from the modus operandi of just turning out arid law, arid law graduates who are mostly inundated with nothing save the legal theories, concepts, and perhaps the procedural steps of the conventional courtroom lawyering without more. When indeed, and in fact, legal education is becoming therapeutic, clinical, and pragmatic. So I have no scintilla of doubt that the intellectual communion that shall be afforded and accorded us via this medium by the thought provoking contributions of these young men and women shall portend a legacy for prosperity. As it is usually said, in uh, aviation Hello, Prof. We lost you. Are you still speaking to us, please? Yes, I'm true. I've given my opening address. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> your network. Oh, my. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for that wonderful one. Um, you're very proud of your students, and we know that your students are also very proud of you. Thank you for that. So at Thank this you. point, we would invite um, Sergio Phillips to take us through in the conversation. But before Seche Phillips comes up, I would like to call you in a minute to just read um, Seche's profile in a minute and then we begin Seche's session. Jeremy, are you ready to do that? Okay, if you, if you allow me, I think I'll just like to share my screen and then see if um, I can pull out the profile. Okay, Chinema, you can go ahead if you're ready to do that. Um, Gideon, uh, if I may, please. Okay, proceed, sir. Proceed, sir. Um, I don't think there's an, a need to, okay, um, because we are already two minutes late and we have to be very, very strict on schedule, considering we're expecting 
a guest. So um, Please perhaps back. I can, yeah. Please so back. if with your leave, may I proceed? Please proceed, sir. Thank you. All right. So um, I don't know if it's possible for me to share my, my screen so that I can um, sort of display a, a very, very short slide while this is going on just so that people who are, are listening online can follow my, my lecture in terms of transition. It would require that I make you host. So I'll just do that. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Seche. You can go ahead. I think you have the first permission. But you also help us to admit people when they try to join. I don't know if it's something you can I, do. I think that would be very distracting. Um, yeah. Seche, can you quickly drop the presentation on the group and then um, Gideon will share? So, Rich, you, you hand over the host back to Gideon. Okay, I'm not sure you'll be able to combine um, speaking okay. now. So you just start speaking, send it to him right now, start speaking, and then we'll get on a project for you. Apologies, everyone. This would be started in. Um, Gideon, please um, quickly send me your email. Thank you. Okay. 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 All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Can everyone hear me now? I'll just um, start intro introductions before Gideon displays the slide. So today I'll be speaking on um, uh, prosecution of, of war crimes under international criminal law or international law. And when we, when we speak of war crimes, I'm sure everyone tends to have a very generic understanding of war, what war crimes, war crimes are or what war crimes is. Now for the purpose of this lecture, I use the term war crimes as a very general phrase to sort of make everyone understand what they are. But first, since our target audi or our audience are not necessarily final year students who do not have a very basic understanding of general public international law, I'll do a very, very quick and basic, should I say sprint of what international law entails. Um, I'll kindly request that everyone mutes their mics while this is going on. Thank you very much. So public international law as it were is basically a, 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 it's a branch of law that that regulates or sort of allows states to interact with each other on a legal basis and under public international law we have various aspects of international law we have international commercial law we have international human rights law we have maritime law we have humanitarian law we have criminal law now, for the purposes of this lecture, I will be focusing specifically on international criminal law. However, you cannot speak of international criminal law without um, speaking about international humanitarian law and international human rights law. So Gideon, if you can quickly 
project um, the slide uh, on, on, on the screen so that we all move along while this is going on. Um, Please just go. Ahead. Please just go ahead. Sir. I'll I'll join. Okay. Myself. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll start with the evolution of international in, international international criminal law. So after World War II in 1945, um, the Allied forces at the time thought of ways to punish people who, talking of the Nazi Germany, uh, Nazi Germany now, who violated what we call customary international law. And customary international law, these are preemptory um, um, laws of international law, which do not, which are non-derogable. And you have things like prohibition of committing genocide and various human rights violations. They are strictly prohi prohibited under international law. And at the time, um, the Nuremberg tribunals were set up by the allied, allied nations, which tried the most responsible officers of, of, of the, the Reich, which is the German um, government at the time for serious and grave breaches of, of, of not, not grave breaches, but serious violations of international humanitarian law. Now, if we speak of international humanitarian law, one is, one's mind is averted to certain treaties and conventions such as the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols. However, the law of war despite not being codified in a single instrument has existed right from time immemorial. So what the law of war does, it basically regulates how parties to an armed conflict conduct hostilities. So at the Nuremberg Tribunal, um, the most serious officers were arraigned before the court and tried at the time. And this sort of kickstarted a global movement to call for a permanent international criminal court. And after you had the Nuremberg tribunals, um, we had the, um, in the 1990s, we had what we call the ICTY and the ICTR. The reason I'm giving this background is so that we understand the evolution from where it started to how we got to the first permanent international criminal court located in The Hague. So at the ICTY and at the ICTR, what we call the ad hoc tribunals, they had specific mandates um, to try individuals who were responsible for serious violations of humanitarian law committed in Rwanda at the ICTR and in the former Yugoslavia in the ICTY. And these tribunals were set up by, a security count, by separate Security Council resolutions. Now, bear in mind that at the time, it was not possible. There wasn't a permanent place where states could come together and agree that international crimes should be prosecuted. And this is why the ICTY and the ICTR were set up to prosecute violations of international humanitarian law in the former Yugoslavia and in Rwanda. And um, so after we had the ICTY and the ICTR, we had several other very specific tribunals which were responsible for trying violations of international humanitarian law. We had, um, the ECCC in Cambodia, we had the SCSL, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, which was based in The Hague, but tried individuals who were most responsible for violations of international humanitarian law in Sierra Leone. And we also had the Kosovo Specialist Chambers. It wasn't until 1995 that the ILC, the International Law Commission, at the time started working on a draft code for the world's first permanent, permanent international um, court. And the treaty negotiation, negotiation took some time and was finally agreed and adopted in 2002 in what is today known as the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So that's a very, very fast but brief um, background as to how we got to the first Permanent Court of, of International Criminal Law, which is the ICC. And when we talk of the ICC, um, one is, is made to understand how does the court work? And when I speak of how the court works, the first thing you always look at is jurisdiction. 
Um, Jurisdiction form. Is the base is Sorry, here. I try to share your screen now. Okay. Um, no, you can just, um, if anyone can share, just share and I'll, I'll instruct the person to, if you have the lecture, just share and I'll instruct the person when to move to the next slide. I've enabled um, other participants, so you should be able to share. Okay. Just a minute, please. Yeah. Um, Gideon, if you can share it yourself, please do. It's giving me some difficulty. I have to go to my Dropbox. So please, if you can share for me, I would really appreciate it. All right. So um, that. Okay. However, I'll I'll just I'll just continue. Um, so I'll start with the jurisdiction of, of the ICC now. So there are four jurisdictional parameters at the International Criminal Court. We have material jurisdiction, territorial jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, and temporal jurisdiction. Now, under international law, general public international law, these are sort of generally speaking. Hello, sir. We can't hear you. In terms of how we can exercise something in Article, um, in Article One, in Article One, and Article Seventeen of the Rome Statute. Article One. Basically, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, Article One yes. establishes the jurisdiction of the court and states that the court is a court of last resort, and lays down what we call in international criminal law the principle of complementarity. What is complementarity? Complementarity, simply put, is that a court complements the national jurisdiction of a court, which means it cannot be seized of a matter if the national, the states which is being investigated has already started um, um, investigating or intends to prosecute the crime. But before we get to this, it is usually tried for the court to consider if crimes within the court's jurisdiction have taken place. I will discuss these crimes in future, but for now, I'll, 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 I'll restrict myself to the jurisdictional parameters of, of the court. So if I read from very, very briefly, if I look at Article 12 of the Rome Statute, Thank you. Um, so Gideon, I'm on the sixth slide now. Oh, sorry, I'm on, I'm on the, the fourth slide. The fourth slide, thank you. Yeah, you can leave it here. If I look at article one of the, of the Rome Statute, it, it simply says that the, the International Criminal Court shall not, um, is complementary to national criminal jurisdiction and the jurisdiction of the functioning of the court shall be governed by the provisions of the statute. What this simply means is that a state has the first right to investigate war crimes. However, where the state is unable and unwilling, very important to note this, where the state is unable and unwilling to consider this, then the ICC can step, can step in. Gideon, please move to the next slide. So the crimes within the court's jurisdiction, we have the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and crime of aggression. The ICC only has jurisdiction over four crimes, only four crimes. Anything outside this, the court does not have jurisdiction. And now for genocide, 
genocide in this field is always referred to as the crime of crimes. It's, it's, it's sort of a crime so grave that it strikes the very conscience of humanity. And in, in the locus classicus case of prosecutor versus Akayesu, this was, this is till date the most popular um, case when it comes to genocide. And the fact of this case, uh, um, Akayesu at the time was um, the, the community leader of a community in Rwanda called the Taba Commune. After the president of Rwanda at the time died in a plane crash when he went for peace talks, Akayesu was responsible for his, in, in Rwanda at the time, what they called communities were prefectures. So Akayesu was responsible for his prefecture. And what he did was he ordered the killings of, please go back to that slide there. He ordered the killings of, of Tutsis and moderate Hutus in his community. Now, when the ICTR in its appeal judgment considered the role he played and the crime which he committed, it referred to the definition of genocide under Article 2 of the Genocide Convention. And the Genocide Convention today has attained the status of customary international law, which means that the provisions of this convention is non-derogable. That means under no circumstance can a state or nationals of a state derogate from their obligations under this convention. The crime of genocide can also be committed in times of peace. That means you do not need an armed conflict to be going on at the time when the crime of genocide happens. Gideon, please, the next slide, thank you. And for war crimes, war crimes are grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. For war crimes to exist, and there are certain acts which qualify as war crimes like rape, murder, sexual slavery, sexual and gender-based violence, um, um, you have a lot of acts which could qualify as war crimes and all these acts are captured in Article 8 of the Rome Statute. For war crimes to be investigated and for a person to be criminally responsible for committing acts of which qualify as war crimes, there must be a nexus. What is the nexus requirement? It means if individual A kills someone during an armed conflict, if that act does not occur as part of the armed conflict, it cannot be prosecuted as a war crime. Therefore, the prosecution has the burden to prove that the act committed, whether it's murder or it's rape or whatever um, incidents uh, that occur under Article 8, occurred in furtherance of the armed conflict. In the case of Prosecutor versus Al-Faki, which happened in a situation in Mali at the ICC, he was a rebel commander that was seized of control in a small community in Mali. What he did at the time was to destroy protected objects under the Geneva Conventions and the Additional Protocol 2. Therefore, he was found um, guilty of war crime, the war crime of atta attacking protected objects. What was most important for this decision to come into play was that all what he did was related to the armed conflict in Mali at the time. Gideon, quickly, um, so that we are, I can take questions. Now, crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity, these are special crimes which must be committed as part of a widespread and systematic attack directed against the civilian population. Article 7 of the Rome Statute captures acts which qualify as crimes against humanity. In terms of prosecuting crimes against humanity, it is usually very typical to see that these acts are carried out and are carried out by a state entity because of the widespread and systematic requirements to prove crimes against humanity. It cannot occur without a state mechanism. You seldom find crimes against humanity being committed by individuals. So either the state or an organization that has effective control over a large geographical area. These are people who can carry out crimes against humanity. For crimes against humanity, it does the, the acts do not necessarily need to be linked to an armed conflict for it to be prosecuted under the Rome Statute. 
Gideon quickly, the next slide, thank you. And the war crime of aggression. The war crime of aggression simply is, um, is, is, is the last crime under the Rome statute. It has never been heard or argued before the International Criminal Court as, as at this time, because it's, it's quite controversial. I'm not going to dwell on this, but basically, it's sort of an act of aggression between from a state against another state. But the jurisdictional parameters, the um, material elements of the crime of aggression are still subject of debate till today. I will go into this much later if I have time. So let's move because we're running out of time. Now for criminal responsibility. Before an individual who commits any of the crimes, which I have mentioned, the four crimes, which is genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression, can be held criminally responsible under, under international criminal law, such a um, person must bear criminal responsibility. And each of the crimes has a mental element ascribed to it. And how do we know that the person who committed this crime did so with the intent for whatever comes out of his action to happen, right? Is by looking at the person's criminal responsibility. And under the Rome Statute, you could either be criminal responsible, but responsible by commission, by ordering and soliciting or inducing, by aiding and abetting, otherwise assisting, and by contributing to a group with a common purpose. I'll give you an example. If I steal this pen myself, I am the direct I'm a direct participant to this crime, right? So I did this myself. If I ask person B, who I have effective command over, if I'm a superior and say, person B, steal the pen, the person, I have ordered that person to do so, but I am not a direct participant to the crime but I will bear criminal responsibility. If I tell the person, if you steal the pen, by tomorrow, 8 a.m., I will open the door, or if you want to steal the pen by 8 a.m. tomorrow, I will open the door for you, and I leave the door open, and I aid and abet that person. That is aiding and abetting. It's like a secondary form of liability. There is some controversy as to what aiding and abetting really is. So the aiding and abetting under the Rome Statute is not typically your normal form of criminal responsibility as you would have in national criminal law. A and A liability under Article 25.3c is very specific. It has a heightened mental element, which requires that for the purposes of, of committing a certain crime, the person who is accused of aiding and abetting orders or sorry, assists the person to commit the crime. So if I sell a knife to a person to commit the war crime of murder, have I aided and abetted that person? It's possible I, I have, but what is important is that I sold the knife to the person knowing that the person will use the knife to kill someone. It is very important. And this is what we call in international criminal law specific direction. At the ad hoc tribunals, this was what was very much deliberated on in the Perisic case. But I will not go into that. I'll just, I just need us to have a very rough understanding of these modes of liability while I quickly brush through them. And the last form of liability is common purpose, which is basically doing or carrying out crimes um, within a group. Um, so if A, B, C, D come together and say, let us commit a crime, they will all bear re criminal responsibility for doing that. And the second generic form of liability is what we call command responsibility, with it, which is provided for under Article 28 of the ICC statute. What this basically means is that an individual who, who is a commander, either civilian or military commander, however, depending on if the person is a civilian or a military commander, the gravity or the mode of liability in terms of proving effective control could differ. But it basically says, if you're a commander, you have a duty to ensure that your subordinates do not commit war crimes or crimes which are prohibited under the Rome Statute. However, if they do commit these crimes when you do not know, 
when you find out you have a duty to punish where you do not punish this could automatically be seen as encouraging the commission of these crimes and such a commander would be a criminal responsibility for that and i will refer us to the case of prosecutor versus hansi hansi hansanovic it's an icty case and also um the case of prosecutor versus akayesu which i earlier mentioned in the akayesu case akayesu did not kill any any Tutsi or any moderate Hutu. However, he ordered the killings. He was very much in control of every killing that was done in the Taba commune. And there's a very popular phrase which is being known in the international criminal law community where Akayesu told um, some of what they called the Interwames. Do you want to know what the vagina of a Tutsi woman tastes like? That was his way of encouraging um, his foot soldiers to carry out mass rapes. And it was also in this case that genocide was, was um, held to be sort of a uh, sort of rape was held to be a form of, of, um, of genocide. So um, I think, can you walk to the next slide? Um, so I'll just, summarize this very, very briefly. At the International Criminal Court, before an individual is prosecuted for war crimes, the first thing which the court averts its mind to is, is the, does the court have jurisdiction? If the court has jurisdiction over the case, according to Article 1 and Article 17 of the Rome Statute, with a combined reading of Paragraph 10 of the Rome Statute, it asks itself, have crimes within the, co the court's jurisdiction or court, which is covered in Article 5, which is genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and a war crime of aggression. If this is satisfied, the court asks itself, who are the most responsible people? And do these people satisfy the preconditions for the court to exercise jurisdiction in this case, which is covered by Article um, Article 12 of the Rome Statute, which means is the person a national of a state party did the crime com was the crime committed on the territory of its state party to the Rome Statute, or has the C UN Security Council referred this matter to the International Criminal Court, as is the situation in Libya? Libya is not a state party to the Rome Statute. However, the crimes which have been committed in Libya from 2012 after Resolution 1970 and 1973 were passed by the UN Security Council. Libya was referred to the ICC for investigations. That's another way which the court can exercise this jurisdiction through a security council referral. And where that is satisfied, the court asks, is the complementarity principle satisfied? Which means, is this state investigating? Is it unwilling or unable to investigate this, this, this case? And if all of these are satisfied, then what the, the office of the prosecutor will open a, a situation and investigate the crimes committed and where it is satisfied that there's a reasonable ground to believe that crimes under the jurisdiction of the court has been um, committed, it would then refer the court to the pretrial chamber for investigation or get um, an order from the pretrial chamber to investigate the offenses and then full trial begins in accordance with Article 61 of the Rome Statute. So, um, that would be all for now. I uh, think I am out of time so that we can take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Seche. Thank you. you. We really appreciate that. That was really, really concise. And thank you for keeping the time. Um, if you have any questions, I'll just like everyone to drop their questions in the chat box, OK? Um, thank you very much. So at this point, let me just ask, is there someone who has a question and you want to um, ask? I'll just give one minute for that. Is there anyone? Okay, admittedly, there is no question, but I'm asking the people at the physical venue and the people on YouTube, if there is any question over there, you could just come type in here for all of us. So okay. at this point, okay, Adam, please, you just have um, 30 seconds. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chief, for such a word. However, my question is regarding the ICC. I've observed that all the cases I've read 
they were the ICC prosecuted um, suspected war criminals. The accused persons were from the African extraction. So would you say that the ICC is actually partial? Why are they not prosecuting people from other countries, other westernized countries? That's what my, one of my questions. The second question is regarding Nigeria. Considering the Boko Haram situation, would you say that going on in Nigeria? There is, what do you think that the ISIS in this kind of situation? Thank you very much. All right, Edem, thank you very much. Sorry, sorry hold on. Can, can Edem take the second question again? You said regarding um, the Boko Haram situation, what? Yeah, I said regarding the Boko Haram situation in Nigeria, would you say that there is an armed yeah. And if there is, what do you think the ICC can do at this point in time to step into the situation? If I got you right, you said, is, it, it, would I say there's an armed conflict, right? Okay, let me help you. Yes. Let them please type your question in the chat box, please, um, so that we don't have the hitches. Thank you. And there's also a question from Kusene. Kusene is asking, Seche, what is the typical workload of a junior lawyer in this practice? So you could just take that in one minute with Edem's question, and then we'll call the next speaker. Thank you, sir. Other questions will come after the end of the last session. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much for your question. So, uh, Adam, regarding your first question, if the court is seen as um, targeting African states, that is not that is not that is not entirely true, because so part of the parameters of jurisdiction of the International Criminal Courts is self a self referral, right? So where a court grants the ICC jurisdiction um, to investigate the state. And Sudan, I think Sudan granted the courts. Um, I want to, uh, it is a last search. We can hear you. Okay, well. In of situation, we have several states. We have Colombia, we have Georgia, Ukraine on the one hand, and we have um, Russia, Ukraine on the other hand. We also have Colombia um, and, and, and several other Eastern European states. I know there is some debate, but most of the states being investigated, not most, but a huge chunk of the states being investigated by the ICC, or which investigations have reached, have surpassed a situation phase to an investigation phase with self-referrals. And, um, there is a global call right now for the ICC to look more into um, other situations. So you have Palestine and Israel, you have Afghanistan, um, you have Georgia. So it's a young court relatively. And if you look at the jurisprudence of international or how international criminal law has, how far international criminal law has come, for a court which was founded in 1998 and which came into force in 2002, We've had what roughly 20 years. So the jurisprudence of the court is still developing and it takes a while for courts to mature or come off of age, if you would say, like the ICJ, for instance. So let's give it some time. And regarding your second question um, about Boko, the Boko Haram situation and if there is an armed conflict, Nigeria right now um, is under investigation. So what this means is that the Office of the Prosecutor in 2020 had requested the pretrial chamber um, and presented some documents to the pretrial chamber requesting for the situation to be moved to an investigation. What this means is that it had examined the complementarity principle and had tried its best to liaise with the Nigerian authorities to see whether they are genuine or if Nigeria was willing and able to prosecute um, those being investigated because not only members of Boko Haram are being investigated but also uh, members of the national um, armed forces are being investigated. However, it found that there wasn't reasonable grounds to believe that Nigeria was investigating those um, alleged crimes committed. So the ICC is currently still looking at, 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 at Nigeria, not just as a situation, but now as an investigation. And 
maybe in five, 10 years, who knows, you never predict these things, but it could move on to, um, if we can have our first case, but I wouldn't hold my breath. And for CoSMS question, what is the typical workload of a young lawyer at the ICC? Um, so the IC, ICC has four arms. We have the registry, we have the OTP, which is Office of the Prosecutor. I also have the um, Office of, um, the, 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 sorry, Counsel to Victims. And it, it depends on which area you're working on. Um, for some lawyers who work with the OTP, even the OTP is divided into three arms. I will not go into that, but it's considerably a lot because there's a lot of investigations going on at the moment. And what they often do is there's something we call Article 15 submissions. So what this means is that civil society and NGOs compile information um, on violations of international humanitarian law from the field and submit these Article 15 um, communications to the Office of the Prosecutor and say, okay, regarding the situation in Nigeria, we have reasonable ground to believe that there are egregious, uh, egregious crimes being committed at the moment um, by non-state uh, armed groups and, and state armed groups. I think um, Madam Fatou Ben Suda is here. Yes, she is. Welcome, Madam Ben Suda. Thank you very much, Seshi. Um, I'm sorry I'm running late. I've been underestimating this uh, traffic here in, uh, in, in, in the UK, in London. So I, I, I just caught up in the traffic and I'm very, very pleased to have this opportunity to join you this afternoon and to uh, follow the, um, the the lectures that are ongoing in a very important field. So um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Bensuda. So everyone, this is um, Dr. Fatou Bensuda. She's the former chief prosecutor at the International Criminal Court. And I have had the very rare privilege of working with her in the past. And I, I, I just randomly told her. Yeah. Oh, Fletcher's network is bad. Yes, I saw that. I see that. Okay. All right. You're welcome, madam. Uh, My I, name I, is... Have a first, okay. All right. Are you back, Sasha? Okay. Madam, you're welcome. My Thank name you. is Mojistola Isay, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Rio. I'm so okay. elated to have you here, madam. And I would like to do the honor of welcoming a distinguished and honorable guest like you into our midst. Uh, she, yes. uh, fellow um, people on, in attendance, she's the current Gambian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and the former prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Dr. Fatu Besuda. It's a privilege to share this altar of intellectual communion with you right now. We are more than honored to have you in our midst, madam. We are eager to gain from your wealth of experience. We are also sincerely hoping to do more with you in the future. Please, everyone, yes. give a warm welcome to the esteemable and <laughs> inestimable Dr. <laughs> Fatu Basuda as she comes up. Thank you very much, madam. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you very much. I'm really very, very pleased myself to be uh, amongst you this, uh, this afternoon and to uh, follow this lecture on international criminal justice, international criminal law, IHL. It's a, it's a, a very, very fast growing discipline, which I think uh, it's extremely important that uh, students, our students and our upcoming generation mm -hmm. are as familiar as possible in this, with this area. And uh, just to mention a word or two about uh, Sergi, um, we have done important work together in this field, and he, uh, he has been of immense assistance to, to me during my research in these, these areas. And uh, it is also a, a, a great pleasure to, to see him in actually in action in this very uh, important passion that we all share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben Suda. Thank you. It's also an honor to, to share a stage with you for the first time. And um, so this is where I school, this is my university, University of Uyua, and this is uh, my Dean of Law. 
-hmm. And I, you, you may not know Professor uh, Moji, but she also schooled in, in Nigeria in the Lagos campus. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah. I, 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 I was in Ife, great Ife. Wow, wonderful. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sure. So, so thank you, thank you, uh, Prosecutor Bensuda. We were just, um, so I did a very rough um, and brief um, lecture on the jurisdiction of the courts, the crimes being uh, tried at the court, uh, individual criminal responsibility, and also mm -hmm. Um, I took questions, but uh, so two questions or three questions have been asked so far, which is a question we always get a lot uh, during uh, during lectures is does the ICC target um, mm -hmm. African states? And <laughs> I'm sure you got that a lot during your, yeah. your, your tenure. And I remember very, very well that um, South Africa at the time tried to withdraw from the court and you know, states like Nigeria at the time said, no, we have to stay back and honor the Rome Statutes and our treaty obligations on the, um, on the, the principle of Pacta Sant Sevanda. Um, so do you have something to say regarding this issue? Well, uh, indeed, I have a lot to say regarding this issue, but uh, given the uh, time limitations, I will just briefly say this is, uh, in fact, a, a, a criticism that has no um, legal basis, actually. And it's a criticism which I believe was coined or formulated by those who were against the ICC or those who thought they were targeted by the ICC. And that was why they thought they need to discredit the court. They need to show that the court was biased against Africans and the, even though the picture was completely different at, uh, from what was happening at the time at the court, but they formulated this criticism that ICC was only targeting African leaders. ICC was against ICC. Uh, ICC was against the uh, African states. But if you look at the reality of the situation, even at that time, you will find that um, those cases, those African cases, so-called African cases, were mostly referrals from the African countries themselves, requesting the intervention of the ICC, because that is how the, the statute stands. Um, if a state that is party to the Rome Statute cannot handle these atrocities on its own soil, because maybe either the law was not in place or they do not have the capacity to do that, because they're part of the ICC, they have signed and ratified the Rome Statute, they could easily refer the situation to the ICC. And this is what most African states did. Those who, which, which investigations were, were ICC opened investigations in. If you look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, they referred their case to the ICC. Likewise, the uh, Uganda, likewise, the Central African Republic, likewise, Cote d'Ivoire, on two occasions, in fact, the first time that Cote d'Ivoire requested ICC's intervention, it was not even a member state to the ICC, but it used Article 12, in which it, 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 it made a declaration, you can do that under the statute, it made a declaration and accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC. So, uh, and, and other countries also that have uh, actually asked for, uh, for ICC's referral, the other two countries, which was uh, Libya and uh, Sudan, ICC came in because the Security Council, which we all know is the ultimate body responsible for, uh, for peace and security in the world, also used the ICC statute, but also used the United Nations Charter and requested the ICC to intervene in Libya and intervene in Sudan. So in all of those cases, I wanted to highlight, I always highlighted that ICC did not proprio motu go in and started investigating. In all those situations, the, the, the law, the statute and the rules uh, of evidence and procedure was fully respected by the ICC. And this is why this case is started. And it's always unfortunate when ICC is blamed, but again, I said, they did make, make a propaganda and perhaps because we knew the reality at the ICC, we were saying that, but this is ridiculous. How can they refer cases to us? And then 
they did not, uh, uh, they're saying now that we are the ones who's targeting Africans, but we did not really take it so seriously, not knowing that this criticism is unfortunately gaining ground and taking roots. So in the end, you have this, we, 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 it, was, uh, we, it has gone too far for us to run up and catch up with it and, and, and to dispel that criticism that was against the ICC. So again, I, I, I come to the fact, I, I, I would say this and then I will, I will yield the floor. Um, ICC, the, the African states that are currently in the ICC from the beginning, it's, it's more African states than in any other region. We need to remember that. African states ratified the, the Rome Statute more than any other region. Um, the referrals that we have for ICC to start were from African states. The cooperation that we were asking for to do our work was from African states and it was coming despite the uh, sort of salt, uh, fallout and the threat to withdraw. It was coming from African states. And I, I chose to say all the time that indeed Africa for once was also showing leadership in international criminal justice and should have the credit for that. But unfortunately, a few people, a few uh, potential uh, targets before the ICC were able to completely roll that around, turn it around, turn it on its head actually, and then started criticizing the court. I will, I will just stop there for now, but this was the reality of the situation. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Prosecutor Bensuda. Um, so um, because of time, I'm sure there's another session soon. So we would, mm -hmm. Gideon, I'll leave it to you to decide. Um, <laughs> okay. That was a very, you know, interesting conversation. There are lots of comments and, um, you know, in the chat box. I'll just like to read a few. And okay. then, yeah. Um, Dignity says, um, beyond the complexity of the jurisprudence of the ICC, the ICC is operating in a world that is politically unequal. Recently, Russia vetoed an attempt by the Security Council to refer the situation in Syria to the ICC for investigation. Political influence as a result of great power competition is one of the key drawbacks of the ICC. Um, mm -hmm. I, that's what Dignity Ecop says, and I don't know if um, Seche um, agrees with that or Dr. Bensu that would want to give a rejoinder. And also, um, Idoro Yenumor just asked the question, with the evolution of drones in armed conflicts, how does one switch the issue of individual and command responsibility? That is for, that's for Seche. Then Dr. Daniel asked, sir, with reference to the current situation, russia ukrainian war, at what point could the ICC come in and what is the protocol? So there are a lot of questions here. People are asking mm -hmm. about the Lakey massacre. People are asking a lot of questions. So I think you should just, you know, make a comment on what I've read. And the other question will just be forwarded um, later in the session or after the session so that we just have feedback. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, so I will say something now. Please excuse, I will speak for Prosecutor Bensuda. She will not say some things regarding situations which are currently under investigation at the ICC um, for very obvious reasons. Um, so I will answer those questions. Uh, you may call it plausible deniability, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. So I will start with um, Dignity's comment. Yes, Dignity, that is very true. Um, you cannot take away the power dynamics that go on um, behind the curtains when it comes to um, international criminal law. Um, some lawyers say, you know, IR, international relations, is, is at the background when there is a sort of an intertwining between international human rights and international criminal law. You cannot take mm -hmm. away international relations. So that is a fact. Mm -hmm. Regarding the drones, the use of drones. So um, when, when we worked um, in... in in, in, in Berlin on, on the arms case uh, regarding the use of drones by the US in Afghanistan. There are certain satellites which were being placed in Germany in some parts of um, Europe, uh, specifically Western Europe that allowed US drones to operate in Afghanistan. The question was always, how do you trace responsibility for these attacks? 
and most of these cases, or some of or some of these cases, have come before the Euro the European Court of Human Rights um, when it comes to liability of drone operators. Because of my position as a legal advisor with ICRC, I will not make a comment on on the ICRC's position, but I will say this that. Um, most of these drones are usually operated by civilians, either CIA operatives or members of the uh, US Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. In terms of jurisdiction, it is really difficult. So most of the time, it's usually a human rights issue as opposed to a criminal international criminal law issue because the issue of jurisdiction is removed. However, the US and its um, European um, counterparts are signatories to certain human rights conventions which allow individuals to bring actions against it. I will uh, mention, for instance, um, uh, in the case of um, um, al Hassani and Badawaki, which was tried at the Euro European Court of, of, of Human Rights regarding airstrikes in, in um, Afghanistan at the time. Um, I think the last, which question, question regarding um, Russia, right? Was it Russia? Ukraine, I think. Ukraine. Yes. Ukraine. 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 Yeah. So, Russia. so, uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, Prosecutor Ben Suda, I will just say this about your tenure. So, during uh, Prof Prosecutor Ben Suda's tenure, she did begin, she opened the situation in Ukraine slash. Russia, because there were certain um, there were there were there were certain acts which qualified as violations of international humanitarian law, which occurred on a territory of a state party, which is Article Twelve Two B of the Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. However, these um, these acts are still under investigation and have not yet reached the situation of a full um, fledged investigation. Mm -hmm. However we must not be too ambitious when it comes to expanding the tentacles of international criminal law. States mm -hmm. choose which treaties and conventions they wish, they wish to be bound by. And where a state says we are not signatory to a statute or a convention, you cannot, liability cannot flow from there. Russia has not mm -hmm. signed nor has it ratified the Rome Statute. Therefore, if certain acts occur in Russia or are, are carried out by Russian agents, mm -hmm. to the extent which they are not carried out on the territory of a, a state party mm -hmm. or affected, or, or you know, the nationals of a state party are not affected, the ICT cannot be seized of jurisdiction over that matter. So mm -hmm. we must try to be very, um, very, very careful in terms of um, expectations. And currently there is discussion by the state of, um, is it, um, I think it's in Norway or Liechtenstein, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. regarding the crime of aggression, setting up a special court to try Russian aggression in Ukraine. Liechtenstein, actually. Yeah, yes, so we don't know how far that is going. That's something very interesting we're looking out for. Mm -hmm. um, so, Ben Suda, I don't know if you have anything to add to the extent which you are allowed to speak on yes. these issues. Yes. I I think it's also just to uh, draw attention to the first instance when um, I was able to uh, open or, or to have jurisdiction in, in Ukraine. As you rightly said, Ukraine is not a state party to the Rome Statute, was not a state party to the Rome Statute, but it was also one of those states that decided to um, make a declaration accepting the jurisdiction of the ICC. So because of that, I was able to do preliminary examinations in, in Ukraine and was able to recommend the opening of investigations into that situation before, before my mandate, my term ended at the ICC. And uh, you will also recall that that declaration said it had no end date. And as a result of which I believe uh, with my uh, successor, successor yes. and the referrals that have been made by other states to the, uh, to the prosecutor, uh, current prosecutor of the ICC, I, I do believe that uh, this is how the prosecutor is now able to work with uh, certain states and to work with Ukraine uh, as a result of the extension 
of, I'm not extension, but also the, the fact that the referral was made without an end date. Yes. Um, thank, you. thank you, thank you, Prosecutor. And Gideon, regarding the last question on the Lekki massacre, yeah. I am. I know this is not what we want to hear, but we're lawyers, we're international lawyers. Um, I think the situation in Lagos at the time, the Lekki, the events around the Lekki target, was the fastest response that. Oh, we lost the chat there. We lost the chat there. Um, so I would want to say that um, this is an unending conversation. It's a conversation that will keep going an on. Incident. And... Okay. I really love to say that this um, conversation is unending and we'll keep, you know, having conversations um, over this. And um, it has been really interesting and exciting. The students are really excited. And I'm Prof and Prosecutor Ben Suda, if you must know, the Faculty of Law University of Rio has been excelling so well at the um, international humanitarian law competitions. And um, yeah, we, we've really been um, exceeding. That shows that the students are really interested in, um, you know, sourcing global to be local. And uh, we're excited um, with the work you're doing. And we also expected that we can, you know, um, get from what you had to teach us today. We, uh, we really appreciate your time. We really appreciate that you shared with us. Um, at this juncture, I would just like to invite Professor Moji to, you know, say um, something, if she has something to contribute there. And after that, we'll just go to the next session. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gideon. Thank you, Seche. Thank you, Prosecutor Benzuda. I'm so excited, like I've said before. And like Gideon said, we, are, we have on board, I think two of those who just won the last round of IHL for Nigeria, and yes. they'll be going for the African round on board. So we, are, we appreciate you, madam. And I want to solicit that we must network. We will work with you in the faculty of law. Uh, we yeah. will take permission of our university management. And I know the mm -hmm. management will be willing to do this with you. So we'll still do things together. Uh, sure. we, we welcome you, we appreciate you. We will yes. get in touch very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. For me too, it has been a real pleasure to have this opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you. I look Thank forward you. to us, you know, collaborating further. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. That's, that's, that's great. So um, at this point, I'd just like to say that um, this event was primarily for the students who are currently, you know, um, having a bit of a gap based on um, an industrial action. And mm -hmm. we see that the students' um, interest has been piqued by this presentation. I know a lot of them would be interested in going global, in doing things at the ICC and all of that. So I'm just telling every student who is interested, um, Professor Kito Bensuda is here. You can, you don't need to meet someone who is your role model. You can begin to model them from afar. So um, try to look them up, see what they are doing and try to, you know, reach out to them. And um, thank you very much. So at this point, we are going to bring a student who um, um, during the strike action has been having a lot of internship opportunities just to inspire other students and you know to pick up um, their books, dust their CVs and their profiles and start applications to the right places. Who knows, you can just get into the ICC like every other person. So I'll be inviting David Samuel to just speak to us very briefly. David Samuel, you'll be having eight minutes to just share your story after which David Etido would you know, get to us. Um, I think this will be the last time I'll be speaking for now. After that, Chinina will take over for me and then I'll come back. Well done. David, you have the floor. Well, um, Gideon, please, can you hear me? I can hear you loud up there. Okay, um, I want to start by thanking the cerebral dean of law, spirit of the law, Professor Mujisola Isayan for this opportunity. I also want to thank Project Next, notable alumni of the faculty for trusting me to take this session, or I'll be brief. And um, thank you very much, Madam Prosecutor Ben Suda. Um, your session was really impactful, and I'm sure most of us will be considering careers in international humanitarian law, and hopefully we get to practice at the Hague. So yes, briefly, I'm just going to be sharing my internship experiences. And I feel it's very important to note that career advancement is for a law student or a lawyer, career advancement is paramount, it's non-negotiable. And I thank, I thank God that I got to understand that really early. I'm coming from 
I'm coming from um, King's College, where I graduated from King's College, that was my secondary school, where basically the Old Boys Association is just like a career network. And there's so much pressure on you to, you know, excel in your career and all of that. And I feel um, that was one of the things that prompted me to, you know, network and get really involved in my career and all of that. So moving on. First thing about, or the first thing I've noticed in my experiences is that somewhat, when you're in the University of Rio, or when you're a graduate of the University of Rio, a student of the University of Rio, you have so much to prove. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that where we cannot compete with graduates from other schools. All I'm trying to say is that most times the top law firms, the big co companies and the corporations, and this even happened in my interview in CFO. Um, I currently intern at Toyota Social Corporation, which is CFO, Africa's largest motor, automobile distributor. And during my interview, I got questions like, oh, what school are you from? I've not heard a lot, a lot about your school. I uh, used to University of Lagos, and this was even in my discussions with the expatriates. I used to University of Lagos, about female all over university and the rest. So when you're a university of your student, there's so much burden on you to be exceptional and do the best because you have a point to prove. And that is the realization that I have come with. And that's the realization that I run with in virtually everything I do. So um, I started interning, my first internship was in 2020. I did it with a firm in Abuja, where Matoebi and co, also known as Omaplex Law Firm. And it's also surprising that the three internships I've been back on, I've done it during strike periods. So uh, this is also a clarion call to everyone on this call, um, the students on this call, please make use, make good use of your holidays, your strikes, and try to gain relevant experience because and in the end, you even if you don't want to practice law, in the end, you might learn one or two things, you might learn one or two things that will help you in your future endeavors and all of that. So yes, my second internship was this year. I did it with a taxation law firm. And currently, like I said, I'm currently with the Toyota Social Corporation. And it has been a nice experience because I'm currently doing, working on, in, I'm, I'm working in the, with the legal department and you know, we don't go to court. So it's majorly in-house, drafting agreements, reviewing agreements, business advisory and all. So it has really helped me. And um, in September, I'll be joining Detail Commercial Solicitors, Nigeria's first strictly commercial law firm for my fourth undergraduate internship. And by the special grace of God, on, in October, I'm not going to announce the name of the firm. I'm going to be joining one of Africa's largest law firms for my fifth internship by the special grace of God and ask his messes. So, so um, now I, I think one thing we need to know is, is it has not always been rosy. I mean, um, I've also had my fair share of rejection mails because most times when you get a rejection, you feel, oh, I'm not good enough and all of that. Um, because you get a rejection doesn't mean that you're, you're not, you're not, you're not, you don't look the part. So it doesn't mean that you're not good enough for the, you're not good enough for the role. It just means that, you, oh, you, 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 can, you can be better. You can be better. And try your best to, of course, get your CV, get your CV in shape, your cover letter in shape. Please make good use of LinkedIn. LinkedIn has afforded me so much opportunities. Leverage on your networks and your connections. I'm sure it's going to really help you in the long run. Secondly, um, meet, meet as much people as you can. Sell yourself out there. Throw your heart into the throw your heart into the ring, and you know try to make good use of your connections. Speak to people. Check up on people. My current internship um, in CFA, we were actually looking for an NYC NYC um, associate, but because I knew somebody who actually graduated from our school, Mr. Antia Bong, he puts me on and all of that. And right now I'm here, and it has been a rewarding experience, both intellectually. Uh, financially, and you know what. Uh, and thirdly, have you. have God at the back of your mind, and I'm sure you excel in your careers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. You know, my please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, David. That was really very enlightening for everybody. So, um, we are going to move over to the next speaker for today, and that's uh. Um, by Sir David Ekido, and he's going to be taking measures and acquisitions. So I, I don't think we need um, what is the doctrine for 
this avenue to figure out. Uh, we all know that the daily day is up and the going to take us on the next topic. So, um, Mr. David, you have the floor. Thank you very much. David, you're welcome. You're doing this with Ian and John. Welcome. Yes, John. yes. I wanted to mention that. Good evening, everyone. Um, evening, this session welcome. is co anchored by David, myself. you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. It, it gives me great joy to uh, for Prof to watch me present. I mean, after supervising me in my final year project. <laughs> so um, The young man has grown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll be taking the mechanics of measures and acquisition. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen so that you can all see. Yep. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I can see. We can see. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Yes. So mechanics of measures and acquisition. Um, the idea why, why we are gathered here today is just to make just to try and broaden our minds, you know, so that you know that there are other fields of law apart from the ones you see and what you know about, especially um, especially litigation. So I, I, I just want to give my brief story. So I, I, as you all know, I'm a student of the faculty, I was a student of the faculty of law. And um, if this same, uh, session was done um, pretty much seven years ago, I, I would be seated on the other side and, uh, of, of, and listening keenly. Uh, and then as a student, I, I, I tell people my story that at a point, I actually didn't believe I would practice law. Um, this was majorly because um, when I see people who were lawyers then, the only thing I understood about law was litigation. So when I meet my senior colleagues at um, Ibom Plaza, uh -huh. you know, Ibom Plaza borders um, the high court. So when people are coming from the high court and then I'm coming back from school, I get to see my senior colleagues with their weave and their beeps and stuff. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to, this is not the life I want to live. I don't want to do this, it's so stressful. I don't know, I just didn't have the passion for it. And I thought, okay, since litigation is what lawyers do, then obviously I'm not going to practice. So I, by my fifth year, started thinking of the businesses I want to establish um, once I'm done with school, you know, and the things I want to do because I thought ah, this law is not for me. But as by the grace of God, I, I experienced several processes that made me, um, that led to this point that I could say I'm, I'm a lawyer that majors on private equity. So um, one, of the, one of that process for me was going to the Lagos campus of the Nigerian Law School. That decision alone changed um, the course of my life. I mean, just being there, I got to see that, um, I just, I got to see that you, as a lawyer, you can do a lot more. We had um, we had senior lawyers coming to uh, give us some presentations to come to speak to us. And I can remember in one of those times, it was Capital Market Association. And I was like, what is Capital Market Association? What does, what does a lawyer do as a capital market lawyer? It just didn't make sense. And I was intrigued. Well, at the, at the law school, I, I wrote an exam, so we were invited to write an exam, and everyone, almost everyone in, in, in school wrote the exams in law school, and then that's to join the um, legal clinic of the Lagos campus of Nigerian Law School. So we, I wrote that exam together with my colleagues, and we were told to come back the next uh, the next Friday that they will announce the winners, you know, uh, sorry, the successful candidates that will join, and the idea was that if you come, everyone will come in, and then if you're not successful, you will leave. As you guys know already, that you know your students wear three-piece suits. So I was like, I can't win my three-piece suit, you know, come and then I won't be successful and I will leave. So I said, I'm not going. I laid back in the hostel to sleep. As I was there, I began to receive phone calls and my phone was just ringing. I was like, what's going on here? And I got a lot of phone calls. I had to pick it. And they said, come now, Did it, the deputy director of the campus is looking for you. And I ran back to um, the hall. Everyone was seated with black and white with their suits. And it was, I was with a three quarter and a polo. And they were like, Are you, is it the one? They were like, yeah. So it turned out like I had the highest score in the exams. And um, I was told to, so just to, hey, come on, go and change. This is just a come on, look, go and change and come back. 
So I had to rush, go change and come back. And that is how I had the highest kind. I was made the head of the Eco Clinic. So I was working closely with the DDG and then it was just a fantastic work. So I was exposed to a lot of things. We started doing soliciting work while we were in school and so on. Fast forward again, during the SNAP test for this, uh, in school, um, we also wrote a SNAP test. Everyone wrote the SNAP test, that's before the bar finals. And then when the results came out for the SNAP test, I, had, I was the best student in corporate law. So that alone, I was like, that means ATDO, you should have a head for corporate law. It means, it means you can do something. And I decided to stick to corporate law since then. I just found that, okay, finally, there is something I like doing in law and I'm good at it. Because corporate law can be technical, you know, when you talk of the financial part of corporate law, the numbers, the logic associated. You see a lot of people run away from me. And I love, I love logic. I you know as lawyers, I'm, I was the best student in math in my class, even though... I used to score 45 over 100, but that made me the best. <laughs> so to, to, at that level of logic and, and the knowledge we had, it was, it was good for me to decide that um, I was going to corporate law. <clears throat> then post, um, post law school, I served in Benin. And from my service here in Benin, I mean, I, I probably litigation, had a very good boss and my boss knew that Benin was not meant, I wasn't meant for Benin and Benin was not meant for me. So he didn't even pressure us to stay back. And he was like, I know all of you want to go to Lagos and that's fine. So upon my uh, completion of my service, I, I moved into the law firm of Jackson Etienne and Eduk where I started my legal career. Again, I rotated there for, so we rotated among uh, various departments. So I did intellectual property department first. Then from there, I moved to corporate commercial. Again, at corporate commercial, my stay was extended for like a month because um, they really needed me to stay around and I was doing some exceptional work there. So my stay was extended. Then I moved to litigation, which I ended up doing just two weeks um, time at litigation at the, um, at the end of the day. So I knew I had to be in corporate commercial. So upon the time that we were choosing departments, I decided to uh, stay back in the corporate commercial department. Uh, in Jackson Etienne, and Edu, your first year post rotation, you do to you you are going to be assigned to two practice areas: business regulatory and advisory, and then uh, and then uh, I think that's general commercial. So business regulatory and advisory will be your company secretarial, your company registration, getting business permits, and so on. And then the um, general commercial will be your employment, tax, and general matters. So you don't get to specialize yet. But as in one of those days, um, the, the partners were working on a transaction. I mean, the senior associates were there, the bigger guys were there. And I was told to, my partner came and asked me to do a, 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 a little research for her on a due diligence. So we're conducting due diligence. So it's just I should check something out. And I did. I did it innocently, not knowing that what I did had uncovered a lot of things that they didn't see during the due diligence process. So she came back and like, you saw this, okay, show me. I showed her, she was like, okay. She didn't make it like, I see this was an issue, but I noticed she started talking to the others, you know, oh, you need to see this, you need to. and then from there, she came back and gave me more things to do. She was just adding more work for me to do. So I kept doing that. So that's, that's how I, um, I started uh, my journey to M&A started, and I, from that day, I started receiving tax on M&A, on private equity, and it became very interesting for me. I don't know, I just loved it. I loved numbers. I, I, I loved uh, the, the, the ingenuity you put into it, because sometimes it can be very, it can be very technical. You know, you have to work with the financial advisors when they're telling you about, okay, how is valuation, or what's the valuation of the company? How are returns going to be calculated? What are the uh, mechanisms that you ring fence your rigs and so on? So it can be very interesting. And I actually enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that. I decided to continue um, being a private equity and major as a physician lawyer. So I just wanted to tell you my story, hoping that that would motivate someone who like um like me does not like litigation and thinking this law is not for me i i cannot be going to court so i will just go back to my father's farm uh, or go back to something else <clears throat> or join tech tech bro and Texas. so um on the screen i just want to um explain to you Ross, why com uh, companies need capital so 
for some companies like Ibom Air, a new company, a startup company, needs the funding right to to carry out to buy new plans to expand its locations and so on. You have another company, um, APIS, it's pretty stable. They're doing fine. They have been around for maybe ten years now. Everything is going well, but they want to grow. So maybe they just want to they want to start APIS Ghana or APIS UK. So they are looking for funds, capital to grow. And then there is rescue. So um, recently, you've heard that Ghana Air has been suspended. So they are they are, they are in crisis, financial crisis, operational crisis. And then you really need money to, if you want that company to survive, you need money to rejig it, right, to bring it out again. So these are the reasons why companies need capital. So it can be for startup, it can be for growth, it can be for rescue. Okay, so types of capital. So once a company has decided, okay, we need capital. The company has to decide, do I want to do debt or do I want to do equity? So you've heard me mentioning private equity, private equity, yeah. So equity is a kind of capital. Debt is another type of capital. So debt is the capital that is pretty much certain. Um, that's what you get from your bank. Whatever you give, um, whatever is given to you, you have to pay back, of course, with interest. So that is debt. So simply debt is capital that you receive and you have to pay back with interest. Um, but equity is a little bit more nuanced. So for equity, you're given capital or as a company, you receive capital. That capital um, is that capital you invest in your business, but then you are not expected to pay back the exact money or any interest on that, uh, on, on that, on what you receive. Rather, you can you are expected to share profits from that business, share a return on investment. So, if someone give for equity, if I'm for debt, if I'm given fifteen naira, I will be asked to pay back seventy naira, and that deal is over. But for equity, if I'm given fifteen naira to invest, and that company makes five thousand naira, I should give the portion of that fifteen naira, or in that the portion of that fifteen naira was in that business. So, if that fifteen naira if the total capital was 100 naira and that 15 naira was 50%, that means once we make 5,000 naira, I'm expected to pay back 2,500 naira. Again, if we lose money in that business and the profit is now 10 naira, I can only collect 10 naira after paying, after investing um, 15 naira. I don't know if um, you understand me. So that's the nature of equity. Equity is return on an investment depending on how much money or how much profit that business has made well that is quite certain so when you talk of m a you have um, on your screens now you have um two uh, majors and acquisition so you're very familiar with assets bank diamond i mean two of them merged and they have um assets so you could see assets was a blue color before Diamond was green, they merged together and you have the blue, uh, blue and green assets that you have today. So that's a result of a merger. Two companies, separate companies coming together and forming in coming together to become one company. We'll still talk on mergers later. Then you have an acquisition. So sometime a while ago, Cook, Coca-Cola, that's Coke that you drink, acquired Chi Limited, which who are the producers of Chivita. And that's an acquisition. So these things happen every day, sometimes not by the big players, alone, but by simple players um, that, that you pass on the streets. They, they look at their books, they look at their uh, materials and say, OK, we need to merge or we need to acquire a new company. So some companies grow by acquiring new companies and they get to um, multiply that way and they to increase their portfolio that way. Okay, so this is I'm not I'm not, I'm not going to speak so much on this, but just give you a, a general rundown. So you have types of sources of capital for equity. So you have private equity. So private equity are is really a broad term for private individuals that give their money. It could be private companies, it could be family fund. So if you go to countries like um, India, Pakistan, there are some families that have so much money in billions of dollars. And they'll just use it to invest in companies. So those will be private equity, broadly put. But then private equity want in M and A term, we try to distinguish that from the smaller, um, the smaller investors. So private equity firm will really be that 
big firm that invests in well-established companies. They have a lot of money and invest in large ventures. They have fixed duration, you know. So that's really private equity. For venture capital, venture capital, you find them, they have some money actually, but they operate um, with smaller companies. They invest in new ventures, you know. So when a new, a new company is starting, if you're building your tech, your new company, you really go to um, venture capitalists and they invest. And that's, they also invest in the same space with angel investors. So you hear people say, oh, I'm looking for an angel investor. So it's just an individual that has money, wants to invest in a company and make money from it and exit. Okay. Um, so we have other sources, um, like capital market. So people could can actually make money from, uh, procure money from the capital market and that will be public company. So you cannot actually approach the capital market if you're not a public company. So for people in, fi in final year, if you're, doing, if you're currently uh, doing company law, you will know that it's doing between public companies and private companies. So only public companies can assess the capital market to raise funds and capital for their business. Well, the private companies um, have to rely on private equity, venture capitalists, and bootstrapping their business to grow. Okay, so I had spoken a little bit about major, but just to distinguish that um, at, in some instances, you can for majors, you can have two companies, company A and B, coming together and company A swallowing company B to become a bigger company. So there's no new company that is created. Two of them come together and A swallows B. I think that's what happened with Assets Bank. Then you have a scenario, the other scenario where A and B come together and then they form a new company, which is company C. So mergers could have happened either ways. Also, we have types of mergers, and this is really for the purpose of your notification to regulators like the SEC, so that's Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. You have um small majors and large majors so typically small majors will not need the approval of the fccpc for you to implement uh, i i think down there I, I have a slide where i'll speak about fccpc if time permits us okay then we have vertical major so vertical major would be you um, in between similar in industries that supplement each other so if um, a bread company is um, is um, acquiring or merging with a butter company or a nylon packaging company for its bread. I mean, that's vertical. Horizontal is a company, two companies are doing the same thing. So that's Assess Bank and Diamond. And then conglomerate is companies that are doing different things. So I can merge, I can be a bank. That will not be possible because of some regulations. But let's say a fast uh, moving consumer goods company can actually merge with another company that is, yeah, that is not maybe producing lead or something, any other company, and that does it. So to consummate a merger, you can have a scheme of merger. This will be pursuant to Karma, that's a company's and allied matters act. You can do it as a form of scheme of arrangement or external restructuring. I won't really go into that. But then you have the nature of modes of forms of acquisition. So for you to acquire a company or how a company is being acquired. So if you understand a company, a company is really, so myself, Gideon, Seche, we want to do business together. And, but we, don't, we want that business to be separate from us, separate from our identity. We come together and form an entity called a company and it's going to be separate. So that company has a personality of his own. So if um, if Neme comes and wants to acquire that company, you know, there are two ways he can do it or wants to acquire a percentage of that company. Neme can either buy new shares in that company up to the percentage she wants to get or we can sell our shares to Neme. So most times in selling our shares to Neme, we get the benefit. So that's the difference between a primary investment. So primary investment is that you are buying shares from the company. So the money you are paying for the shares goes into the company and the company uses it to um, build its operations. But when it's a secondary investment, it is myself, um, Seche, that is selling to Neme and that money and the proceeds of that money comes to us. And then another way, that's a form of a share sale. So what I just spoke to is a share sale. 
another form of sell of or acquisition of the company that we can as well say, say che, we're tired, let's just sell everything that we have. So all the the um the machineries, the the land assets, the cars we have, we just sell that alone. Sometimes people also do a business transfer. So they are transferring both the assets, the intellectual property, that's the name of the business, the technology they own, they transfer even the employees to the new company. And that's a total business transfer. And then acquisition can be in the form of 100% acquisition. So I'm buying everything and chasing out Seche and myself, or the person is buying everything and chasing out Seche and myself, or a majority acquisition. So I'm acquiring, let's say 70%. People acquire majority so that they can take um, decisions for the company, so they can influence decisions. Because in companies, decisions are taken based on the percentage of shareholding that you have. So you want to acquire majority so that you can take decisions. But I mean, you have to have your money, even not you won't be able to afford it. So some people just want to go into a company, benefit, and acquire minority interest. So imagine having minority interest in MTN. Just imagine having. 3% of MTN, a lot of you will stop coming to the faculty of law by tomorrow and will be sending the dean check because of the money you will start making. So it's fine to have minority interest and people acquire minority interest. Okay, so other modes of acquisition, takeover. This you hear if for some of us that watch some movies, you hear of mandatory takeover, you hear of takeover. Just really, um, really in terms of percentage, when you acquire a certain voting percentage in a company, um, you've taken over and then you have to do a mandatory takeover. Sometimes one that has a majority interest might want to take over the company completely. They will now in, uh, engage in minority squeeze out and then arrangement on sell, which is um, simi similar to what we have in Kama is a scheme, one of the ways of transferring um, acquisition through a scheme. So these are the legal frameworks. Uh, I think you should just feast your eye on it. Maybe just look at it. So you have um, your companies and allied matters act. Um, you have your investment and security act, SEG. So secure, these are security and really applies to public companies. Another um, very important group of laws are your tax laws, especially in Nigeria now, tax laws are becoming very important. I'm sure by tomorrow when you listen to Kelechi, um, you get to understand and appreciate tax. Very important because the government is now very revenue driven. So it regulates m and a. Then competition law. Competition law has also gained traction with the passage of the Federal Competition and uh, Consumer Protection Act. So government wants to see if you, know, you are, if your business is competitive. Although for me, this has really been so revenue driven again because yeah, we have instances where we pay up to 200 million to government. I've, I've worked on a transaction where we pay 200 million to government as only FCCP CPs, just for a transaction to be cleared. Um, you have sector law, sectoral law. So if you are you're the, the merging companies or the company to be acquired is a, is a bank, is an insurance company to be influenced or to be guided by the provisions of the insurance act, Pension, if it's a pension uh, administrator by the Pension Reforms Act, if it's a company in the communication sector, the Nigerian Communication Act, Petroleum Sector, Petroleum Act, and um, Aviation Sector, Civil Aviation Act. Okay. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. I know I'm trying to be fast because we've lost um, a lot of time. This is the typical process flow for an acquisition. Notes is an acquisition, not a merger. So for a merger, the process is more complicated, but we thought it's just good to start with an acquisition process. So uh, some of us here might be familiar with NDA. I mean, if you had time, I'd ask someone to tell us what an NDA is, or maybe you want, someone could just put it on the comment box. Um, from after signing your NDA, which is, okay, let me just explain that, which is your non-disclosure agreement, um, because you want to keep the terms of the agreement confidential. If you are going into a transaction, an acquisition transaction, likely you are going to open your company books, right? You are going to tell someone, come and examine me if I'm good enough for you to invest in. So the person will look at your financials, look at your employment contract, and a lot of things, which Ian is going to talk about shortly. And then once that is done, um, you need to sign an NDA so that one does not share your information after that then you sign the term sheet. So your term sheet is the key term. So you want to agree before you even go in, let's know how much am I going to pay for this? 
before we start suffering ourselves, suffering our hair, doing due diligence, let me know that I'm going to, once I come into your company, I'm going to be a director of your company. Is that agreed or not? So before we even go into anything, Tell me, promise me that everything is fine and you are going to give me warranties that you have paid your tax, that you have not, you are not um, defaulting any government um, in any loan application, you are not def defaulting any government regulation. So you are just going to give me some of those promises in a term sheet. Then we now say, okay, since you're giving me these promises, now open your books. That's where due diligence is about. And we conduct investigation into the company. So for where I work now, the, the law firm of Udon, Udon, Mabelo, and Asage, we, we have a team of, let's say, 10 to 15 persons looking into various aspects of um, the company. We're looking at your book finances, we're looking at your loans, we're looking at um, your, your disputes, we're looking at everything which Ian is going to seek on further. And then once we are done looking at that, we now issue a red flag report which now tells the buyer or the investor, okay, I want to continue or I don't want to continue. Once the investor is fine and wants to continue, we move into documentation. We have another slide for documentation. And then, so the principal document for in an acquisition will be a share purchase agreement. That is when it is a share deal, or you have a share subscription agreement. So like I explained earlier, if you are buying new shares into the company and the money is going into that company, you are getting, you are, you are actually signing a share um, subscription agreement. But if you are buying shares from existing shareholders, that's from Etido and ENA, and you pay the money to Etido and ENA, then you're going to do a share purchase agreement. There are circumstances where both happen. So you have a share subscription and share purchase and subscription agreement. You could find that. And then if it's an asset deal, you have an asset transfer agreement or a business transfer agreement. These documents are heavily negotiated. I mean, that's why we are here as transaction lawyers. So they are heavily negotiated, heavily drafted and um, negotiated by both parties for us to agree. So once we agree and sign the documents, it is signing of the documents, we call that, okay, we have signed the document. Then we have to move from signing to what we call closing. So upon signing that document, everything we have agreed to sell, we have agreed to sell and, have, and and then the investor has agreed to buy, right? So, but in between that process from when money actually moves hands and then um, shares or assets actually moves, that is when you now need to see your FCCPC if it's required, you need to meet set if it's required for approval, you need to even uh, get some approvals from maybe shareholders or major, um, major third party contractors, you know that you are engaging with. Then once you have gotten all your approval, then you move to completion and you comp and you close. And you, that means you pay the money and then you receive the shares from the investee company or you receive the shares from the transferees of the shares. Then you move to post-closing. So post-closing is really housekeeping, you know? So you, you fell your returns at the CSC. So if you have new directors, you have to appoint them. You have to fail that at the CSC, right? So you do that at the CSC. And then um, sometimes SEC, you need to make some filing. Sometimes there is some post-closing conditions that you have to say, okay, once we finish closing, you have to go and obtain your business permit. Once you finish closing, we didn't have a um, factory license. You have to go and get your factory license. So that will fall on that post-closing, okay? Okay, I'll hand over to Yene to take us on the due diligence investigation process. Thank you very much, Itido. And um, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Prof. Um, it's, it's a pleasure uh, once again to, to be here. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, all right, great. So um, I think Etido has, you know, um, given a very solid um, overview of what M&A is about and why, you know, we really um, undertake M&A transactions, that's mergers and or acquisition, you know, transactions. So um, like he had noted, and just briefly to point out again, it could be to save a dying company, right? A company that's, you know, ready freely, maybe bought over by, by another entity. And that could be, 
you know, in the form of an acquisition or in the form of, of a merger. And it could also be for the purpose of um, economics of scale. Um, both businesses are looking to, they believe they can do better, you know, together than individually. So um, just like you have, I think, Exxon Mobil. Um, Exxon was um, an independent company different from Mobil. But um, some time ago, they came together to, to form Exxon Mobil by way of, you know, a major and um, obviously their balance sheet and what they're able to do um, in the combined form is, is much um, better and um, over and beyond what they would have done individually. So due diligence investigation, you want to merge with another entity. So take the mobile, um, Exxon mobile case. Exxon wants to merge with mobile or acquisitions, you know, scenario where Access Bank wants to acquire um, Diamond Bank. You have to be sure, just like when you go to the market to buy clothes, to buy food stuff, to buy, you know, secondhand vehicle. You know, I, I think the example of second vehicle, you know, really, really catch it is. So you have to, you know, check to confirm that all parts of whatever you're buying, vehicle, for example, is okay. You want to check that the, the car is motorable. You want to check that the carburetor doesn't have issues. You want to check that the brake pad is working. And if at the end of the day, you know, um, you find some issues in all of these, what, what really is, what really are you going to do? You may make a decision that, look, I don't want to buy the car again. I don't think it will serve the purpose. Or you may say, look, this is your car that we had agreed to million when we were talking. From all of the issues that I've seen, I think it is 200,000 that, that, that this car is worth, you know, and all of that. So that's really the purpose of due diligence. It will give you a view of what you're buying, in this case, the company, and um, how much you're buying the company for. And there is barely any due diligence, there's barely any MA transaction that is hashed without due diligence investigation being carried out. You see that um, Elon Musk attempted, you know, the other time to, to well, take over by um, Twitter. He didn't conduct a, a due diligence investigation, but he made an offer on the table. And I think, um, a month after, his legal advisors came back to him to, to tell him that, look, this company wants to buy Twitter. It's not as good as you think. There are some issues with it. And obviously, it's not trying to backtrack, you know, and all that they're in court and the court will have to decide that. But that's just that just goes to show or emphasize the purpose of due diligence. I want to know exactly what you're buying and to, to ensure that you know, um, you're getting real value, you know, for your money. So in due diligence, you, you would often conduct corporate um, due diligence just to check the corporate status, you know, of the company and to be sure that everything is involved. In a share sale, you know, for example, um, let's say you, you, want to, you want to buy 100% of the company. Uh, let's use the access and diamond situation. So access wants to buy 100% of diamond. So he's going to buy it through the shares, right? He's going to buy 100% of the shares, you know, of um, Diamond Bank to become the full owner of Diamond Bank. So one of the things critical that Access Bank in that case, you know, in, in, in that transaction must have looked at all the advisors of Access Bank is to ensure that, in fact, the, the um, Diamond Bank or the sellers, the, the, the people selling the shares in Assets Bank actually own those shares, right? You don't want a situation where um, the share is under, the shares are, have been charged, you know, to third parties or the shares have in fact been transferred years before. And like the legal principle says, which you would already know, never that could not have bet. You can't give, you know, what you don't have. So if you as somebody seeking to acquire a company, you don't conduct due diligence to assets and that even the very, you know, um, thing you're seeking to purchase as the shares is residence in the person from whom you're trying to buy it from, then it becomes a fair transaction, you know, from the beginning. And there over, you know, there are also a lot of things to check, you know, at the corporate side of things as well to ensure that they are on our returns, and all of that. So licenses permit and regulatory compliance, you know, it's, it's key for you to check, you know, that as well. 
So you want to purchase a company as a bank. Banks are regulated by the CBN and um, they are issued um, operating license, banking license. So all the banks, you know, you know, have banking license that have been issued to them by the CBN. So it is a big deal, you know, for you to check that. Oh, it might not even be a bank. It might be an insurance company. It might be a pension fund. I recently concluded the acquisition of a of a pension fund custodian. And one of the things, obviously, you look out for the regulatory side is to ensure that they have a PENCOM license and, you know, they are going concern, you know, in that regard. So it's, it's, it's key because um, if you say the company is a, a pension fund custodian, it doesn't have a PENCOM license, that's the, the PENCOM commission, it doesn't have the national PENCOM, a license from the national PENCOM pension commission then obviously you know that company is not what it is and so you therefore have to check for you know there are literally an avalanche of things to check you know at the license permit and regulatory side you have to check all of that and why you know why would you check for all of these and what what would you you know the purpose of due diligence isn't just to pro produce a report from from the legal side i know as lawyers you prepare due diligence reports and it's 200 pages, 250 pages, you know, 150 pages, you know, and all of that. But that's not really the purpose. It's not the volume, right? That, that makes the report. It's the recommendations inside the report for your clients. And um, what are you going to do with your clients if you look and you see that the client doesn't have some required permits? You know, typically as legal advisors, we divide the risk into three. You know, we have the, the one we call the red flag. Um, we have the one we call the amber flag, you know, somewhat yellow, but deep yellow. Then we have the yellow, you know, flag. The red flag would typically be for issues that are so critical as from, from your stand as legal advice. So you, you see that your client is seeking to advance 36 billion, you know, Naira to purchase a company. And therefore, you know that you know the consideration, the stakes are high you know, in relation to the transaction. So you want to be able to advise your clients: go ahead, don't go ahead, or um, you can take a commercial decision you know, in that regard. So the red flags typically, you know, be for uh, matters you think are so critical that should be able to prevent the business, should be able to prevent the transaction from going on. So when you when you prepare your due diligence, some, some matters will be red, some matters will be yellow. So the red are those critical items that you believe that, look, this company you are, you are looking to purchase, it doesn't have a license. In fact, it's, it's, it's never done business before. It's, it, it, in fact, it doesn't exist in the records of the CAC. Therefore, that's a red flag. Your amber flag will be for issues that are very critical, but not critical enough, you know, to, to call the transaction, you know, to a stop. So for example, you know, I was taking a DD um, presentation in my team, um, I think two days ago or yesterday, and um, I'd use this example, you know, to just let them know that um, if, you, if the company you're seeking to purchase has seven landed properties, and you find out, for example, in the course of your due diligence that, um, out of the seven landed property, six have been used as collateral for loans. And um, the loans are due, the loans are not paying, and there's a higher risk uh, that those landed property, which form part of the valuation of the company, will be taken over by third party. Then that's a serious risk, but it's not serious enough to, to make you stop the transaction. Then there are those you know, risks that are just for the information of your clients, you know, like the company has not filed in its annual returns for the past two years, or the employees of the company, you know, have been resigning very frequently. You just want your client to know that, look, look this company you're buying has its risks, but obviously it's not a very serious look. So um, loan security and arrangement, I already mentioned that. So you want to be, you want to ensure that your comp um, a company that has been valued at 200 billion Naira, um, does not have a debt, you know, for example, that is 100 billion Naira. If the debt is 100 billion Naira and the company is valued, your purchase price that you've agreed with your client or that your client has agreed with the third party is 200 billion Naira, then that will mean that you have to, you know, um, highlight this to your client so that 
it's a valuation point for the company to say, oh, look, the company is owing X amount of money. Then for the purpose of valuation, we have to deduct you know, those outstanding obligations to third parties and revalue the company. So due diligence just basically helps you to know what's really the company about uh, from all of the information that you've been able to see, you know, whether on the VDR, that's the virtual data room or physically, or they may provided, you know, separately via email or in the course of conversations, you want to take a review to advise your clients, you know, on what exactly, you know, they should do. Should they proceed with the transaction? Should the value of, you know, um, the, the assets they're seeking to purchase or the company they're seeking to purchase be, be reduced, you know, ETC. Then you also have um, due diligence conducted across the assets and real estates, you know, of, of the company. I've already mentioned that. So you want to look um, the properties it owns, the lands, the buildings, the 30 buildings that it owns. Um, do, does it have governor's consent? Recently, you know, I reached out to a couple of my colleagues because um, a client was seeking to acquire a business and um, that business, you know, owned about 400 properties across, you know, Nigeria. So um, we had a tax to, you know, conduct due diligence on this real estate. And they are obviously in separate locations, some in Zafara, some in Kaduna, some in Calabar, some in Lagos, across, you know, um, across the country, you know, and all of that. So you just want to, you know, be sure that, look, at the end of the day, you are at the registry in which all of these properties are located and you're able to conduct um, findings to ensure that the properties are registered. There's no charge over the property. The property, you know, belongs to the business, you know, and all of that. Material contracts. So for some contracts, it is a change in control um, provision, really. So where a business is being bought, obviously, you know that there's a change in control over that business. So for some contracts, there's a trigger event, basically saying, for example, that where there's a change in control, um, consent of the other party, the contracting party should be sought and obtained, or the company would, would or, the, or the contract would terminate automatically where there's a change in control you know, of the target company. So the company being bought or sought to be bought is typically called the target company, while um, the company seeking to acquire the other company is mostly called, you know, the acquirer. So you want to check those material contracts and it's not all contract, that's why it's called material contract because some companies may have 50 contracts, depending on the size, they may have 200 contracts, they may have 800 contracts, so, and you, you, you preparing a due diligence report and you have to know the threshold to say, for example, that um, we are going to deem contracts in which the consideration are over 20 million as material contracts. Every other contract that the consideration is up to 20 million, we are not looking at it or we are just looking at it, you know, to be sure that things are in order, but, you know, the material contracts would, you set a threshold for it. So you want to be sure and why would you, you know, look at a material contract? Because when the when the acquirer takes over, you know, the target, it still needs to, you know, be functioning, right? And it has to be functioning off the back of some of these contracts with suppliers, with third parties, with vendors, and all of that. Even of the contracts have changed control provisions, and they all terminate at the point, you know, of the takeover, at the point of acquisition. Then the company is in limbo because. Um, no vendor, no supplier, and they are unable to generate revenue and all that. So you want to check all of that. And if they are consent to be sought and obtained, then they are sought and obtained ASAP. Or, I mean, we typically want to keep them as conditions, precedent, CPs, you know, that after signing, the, the seller has to present evidence of this consent which have been obtained before the transaction, like it's had mentioned, is closed or before we get to completion. So pension and other matters, you know, you, you find that in many situations that some companies are not compliant with their, you know, statutory remittances, pension, you know, and um, other employee uh, remittances like that. You have remittances under the NSITF, you have remittances under a couple other, you know, regulations, and those are liabilities, right? So even purchasing a company that it's in liability of pension of over 206 million naira, for example. That would mean that, 
you know, when I become the owner of the company, the, the tax masters or uh, the, the PENCOM guys can, can come, or even the employees, because it's for their benefit, can come after me to say, look, this company is in the third in this enough X, Y, then I'll have to pay. So you want to also check that the company is not, you know, um, doesn't have outstanding obligations in that regard. And if they do, obviously, it may affect valuation or it may become a CP point. So, you know, the purpose of your due diligence is just to guide your client to say, look, some matters have to be done before completion. So it becomes a CP point, a condition precedent to say we sign, yes, but before we proceed to close it, before I pay you, you show me evidence that you've completed this. Some might go to valuation to say, look, um, this is a critical matter. Let's take it down and let it affect, let's subtract it and it affects the valuation of the company. Some matters might be some that require representations and warranties, you know, to be made. So um, for that purpose, you, 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 see, you see certain issues in the course of the evidence report that are not, that are not very, you know, clear and um, you require representations and warranties. Some require indemnities, you know, um, to be made and indemnities obviously Okay, not obviously, but indemnities, as you may not become aware, you know, will typically be required for um, very specific matters. So you see tax outstanding tax liabilities, for example, of over a billion naira spanning 10 years. So you are going to put a provision in the transaction document, SPA, that share purchase agreement, like Etido has mentioned. And um, you're going to say something like that. The company is going to indemnify, i.e. pay back in full, you know, um, any loss that you or the company, which you've now acquired, um, so far as a result of any outstanding obligations in, in this regard. But just to know the indemnities are time bound. It could be three years, five years, and they're always subject to certain caps, you know, baskets, the minimum threshold, you know, that's upper and lower thresholds, you know, and all that. So litigation, you also want to see what the bucket of litigation is like for this company that you are, you are purchasing. Uh, how many, you know, material litigation, of course, because if somebody is suing a company that has a generated revenue of 100 billion, you know, every year, if company, if somebody is suing for 200,000, you just, you don't have to note that kind of um, stuff on, on the, on the due diligence reports, you know, so you also determine a, a threshold to say, okay, maybe material litigation and litigation that maybe relate to the winding up of the company or relate to uh, monies up to 20 million, 50 million. It is spoken about taxation, intellectual property, critical as well, because obviously, you know, for trademark, um, the, 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 it's, it ties on who registers first. So if the company, for example, is going by a particular trade name, you want to ensure that that trade name has been registered. And if it had previously been registered and has expired, the registration has expired, you want to you know, be sure that um, the registration has been renewed and all of that because it's to affect, it's affect you know, the branding of, of the company. I'm yet to see a situation where IP issues become a red flag. They've never really been a red flag because you, know, you can live with it. It, you, you can manage the situation even if it has not been registered. It's typically either an amber you know, flag or a yellow flag. Then lastly, on this point, I think employees as well. So you want to look at the contract of employees of key staff. So you're taking over a business, a tech business, for example. You're buying into a tech business, 100% of a tech business. And um, the business will require you know, the input of those that have always been running the business, maybe top management staff, for example, people that, you know, know how to run the business, people that know the coding, you know, and all of that. And you want to be sure that when you take over the company, you know, you can have maybe five, 10 of the employees, if not all of them, you want to be sure that there's continuity. So you have to look at their contract of employment to be sure that that continuity can happen because, it doesn't happen often, you know, but, you know, there are contracts of employment that also have changing control provisions, you know, as well. You also want to ensure that um, the, the employees are happy and they can, you know, move it to, because typically in our jurisdiction, not like what you have in the UK, you, you do not have a situation where employees automatically move in an acquisition or in a merger. So you typically will have separate um, contracts of employment entered into 
between the, between the employees in the events that you are trying to move them over as a result of an acquisition or a merger. And you want to be sure that their contract of employment doesn't have restrictions in that regard. And if they do, you know, a process begins to happen wherein um, it can be amended or something can be done about it. So in a nutshell, that's what due diligence investigation is all about. So just give you more than a best eye view, uh, maybe an ego eye view now into the business of the company, you know, um, to, to, to as a client who, who is purchasing, you want to know exactly what you're buying, you want to know what your risks are, you know, what you should take, what you shouldn't take. And the findings in the due diligence will affect the drafting of, of the transaction documents. You know, and all of that. So, um, for the sake of time and um, um, all of that, I think I, I will stop here and hand over, you know, um, the presentation back to to Etienne, who will take us. Um, Thank you. To Thank you end. so much, Lenny. Like, that was yeah. not just a bad idea. Um, I'm sure a lot of people can conduct due diligence by tomorrow <laughs> from Thank your you. <laughs> from your analysis. Thank you so much. So, I mean, that's all. There's nothing nothing more I can add on due diligence. Yene has said everything. Um, so I I had, I had spoke about non-disclosure agreement. I think I mentioned term sheets, um, which is the preliminary agreement that we sign. So sometimes we structure. So I'm talking about documentation now. So the documents we actually get to sign. So the lawyers prepare and get to sign. So structure notes. So um, in most circumstances, you need to structure a transaction. And this is where um, a lot of ingenuity, a lot of thought process. Okay, do we need a company to be at the holding company level? Do you need to incorporate another company? Let that company hold this, buy this other company. And then rather than us investing the company directly, we hold it there. Do we need to um, delete from the Nigerian Stock Exchange so that it can become a private company. They now use private personnel from memorandum. So there's a lot of thoughts that goes into structuring and we use structuring notes to, to solve that. Then legal red flag report, we've, talk, we've spoken about that. That's what the just focused on. And then the definitive agreement, we've talked about share purchase agreement. Um, I, I'm not sure we've talked about shareholders agreement, but most in most acquisition transactions, once a company is coming in, an investor is coming in, you know, someone is investing um, 20 million US dollars in a particular company, they want to have some level of assurances. So they get that through shareholders agreement. So the a shareholders agreement will provide that they will be given board seats, that they put seats on the board. The shareholders agreement can provide that they'll be given um, biannual um, reports. It will provide that um, you cannot just transfer your shares and leave them. So imagine you, the owner of a company, you made someone invest 15 million, the next day you resign and sell the shares. So they'll have things like lock up period to make sure you, the founder, does not resign and leave them, maybe for five years post their investment. So a lot of things come into shareholders agreement. The other ones here are still different ways um, we, we um different documentations that we have. So you have acquisition agreement, investment agreement, transaction implementation agreement, combination agreement, scheme documents. All these are agreements that we sign in different m &A processes. Okay, so by the time you're going to get approvals from your regulator, most likely they'll give you a letter of no objection. So like a CBN will give you a letter of no objection saying we don't object to you proceeding with this transaction, so go ahead. And if it's a letter, if it's um, after, and then you got, you can also have disclosures against your warranties. You have disclosure letter, then you move to complete where you have the share certificate, register of members. As once you have been given the shares, so they'll give you a share certificate evidencing that you're now a member of that company, your register of members and your resolutions. Then post completion, you have your CSC filings. Um, I said I'll speak a little, uh, a little on this, but. Uh, I don't think we have so much time, but typically once you are having a transaction, you have to look at the provisions of the law and as you relate to regulators, what do I need to do with the CAC? What do I need approvals? Do I need to get from my sector regulators? I've spoken about that earlier. Um, do I need, does this transaction need to go to FCCSP for approval? So there are trigger points for FCCSP approval and that includes what's the size of your company. That's what the turnover you are making. So if you are making up to, as a, as a Nigerian company, up to 500 million, or with your person that wants to buy, people are making up to 
and uh, one billion um, turnover in a year, you need FCC approval on if also that acquisition amounts to a change of control. What the NA was talking about is the change of control means when you have people as majority shareholders or majority directors, but because of this acquisition, they will no longer be the majority directors controlling and taking the decision on behalf of the company. That means there's a change of control. So once there's a change of control and the company is a large company because of the turnover, that will most likely need um, the approval of the FCCPC before you proceed. The Federal High Court, in terms of measures and, and arrangements that are done by way of scheme, you definitely need the Federal High Court. Um, I think we can stop there for now. Okay. Ian, do you still want to take this or because the time has really um has really gone? Yeah, I mean I'd find a way to, to include okay. that in the in the presentation. So yeah, uh, it cannot be okay. So we wanted to give you the questions, a life, yeah. A live transaction um that Ian had handled and then but that's um that could not be taken not be taken now so um if we can just take questions um i'm sure a lot of people are, are tired despite gaining too much but i'm sure you'll be tired and you want to leave i saw a question from okamadiri um okamadiri for end out payment um is not conventional as you can imagine um but i'm i'm beginning to see it and the way I see N out in Nigeria is that a lot of people use it as a, a lot of investors use it as a bargaining chip rather than as incentive. So if, if you are a startup and then you want an investor to come in and buy your company at, um, and come in and invest, let's say, and take and buy 50% of the company at 10 million US dollars, the investor can say, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not ready to pay 10 million, I'm ready to pay seven. But if within five years you are able to meet this um, this certain return on investment, uh, you're able to grow the company from, let's say, one thousand user tech company from one thousand user to ten thousand, the revenue annual revenue from two million dollars to ten million dollars. I'm going to add that extra three thousand three million dollars that you asked for. So it's not common. I mean, if we do the number of uh, uh, SPAs and we've had a lot of transactions, it's not really common. But also as a bargaining chip, a, a lot of in, some investors are actually chip that in that really works for the investing company rather than just um, giving up on that particular amount of money they were asking for um, as part of the payment for the purchase of their shares. Um, is there any other question? So if there is none, um, we'll wrap up. Anyone wants to ask a question? Any other questions, guys? Um, if it's just the uh, streaming via YouTube, you can send in your questions and we'll attend to them. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, thanks, Collins. Okay, so in the absence of any other question, thank you so much for staying on. Thank you for listening to us. I hope you all learned something new and I hope that um, from today's session, uh, We've spot someone up to either consider a career in international law or a career in m &E. Tomorrow, we're going to have very powerful sessions too. My friend Kelechi will be talking, uh, taking you guys on taps. And then my Leonard Senior, I do more, will be taking you guys on um, energy law. And I can assure you, it will be as enriching as today's session was, and you'll get to learn a lot. So please see you all tomorrow. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Able Thank you. To have that enlightened us. We really appreciate the presence of the session. Thank you so much. All right. So I guess we'll be ending this year. I don't know if the dean is still here and she would have something yes. to say. Yes, yes. yes. So we leave by I'm here. Yes. Uh, Prince I'm still here. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for participating in today's um, event. I must also please record my deep seated appreciation to the amiable Dr. Fatu Besuda, Besuda for our highly esteemed presence here today. I want to encourage us to join very early tomorrow and to propagate the gospel of this program tomorrow so that we can have more participation 
Um, thank you very much. As we meet again tomorrow, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. You know, I think you should yes. mention to people that there's a physical location oh, yes, for people yes. in New York yes. so they can yes. join tomorrow. Can somebody from the physical location say say hi to everyone so that at least you know it's on the shot. All right. Yeah. They are waving. They are waving. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Chineme, could you mute yourself, please? Thank okay. you. All right, this is it. Yeah, this is where we'll be ending this today. Um, we're looking forward to having everyone tomorrow. And tomorrow, we are, we really apologize for taking 22 minutes from, you know, promise time. But tomorrow, we'll try to keep it short and simple. Once again, we're happy that you did this with us. Um, from me and my co-compare, co Chineme, it's a goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.